know what that meant. We were just singing about a fountain that really had lots of water flowing out of it, right? And it wasn't until I got older where I began to understand that what they're referring to, because the song never actually t- says this. The song just goes on deep and wide, deep and wide, and pretty soon you go, mm, and wide, mm, and wide, right? And it's just kind of fun to sing. Um, but it never really says what that fountain's all about. What's the fountain all about? Well, we sang about that actually this morning. Several times we used the word fountain in the, in the, uh, in the songs that we sang. And so it was a familiar term, term for us. The idea of the fountain was this, this is overflowing flood of God's grace that was just outpouring from him. And when you read the book of Revelation, and you read the last chapter of the book of Revelation, it talks about a river that flows from the throne of grace that just is so wide and so deep. It is just all-encompassing. That's what that song was all about. Again, I didn't fully grasp that until I get older. And I kind of understand that we, in Christian terms, use the idea of a fountain to be an idea of grace. When we look at the text today, we are going to see the grace of God flowing very deep and very wide beyond the context that we have seen yet in the book of Mark. As we journey through this continued book, we hope that together not only are you learning about the book of Mark, but you're learning about who Jesus is as, and what the gospel is. And that together we are beginning to see what it means as followers of Jesus to live as citizens of this kingdom that the gospel talks about. Because the gospel says this, the gospel says repent For the kingdom of God is at hand. That was the early message of the gospel. The kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is ready and and welcoming people into its midst. And they happen to come through the one door that that has arrived, and that door is Jesus Christ. So you come through Jesus and enter into the kingdom, and now you go and live as citizens of the kingdom. And as we've been journeying through Mark, we continue to see the proof that Jesus is the door. That he has got all the power, he has all of the um, qualifications that we're looking for as the door into the kingdom. As the one, the entry point that we need in order to enter into the kingdom of God. And we see him healing people and being gracious and we see him teaching. Last week we were reminded that he was the rabbi who challenges us as followers of Christ. And then that's the other thing we see in the book of Mark is that Jesus is training his disciples to carry on that ministry of preaching the gospel to all the world through every event and circumstance that he has them going through. So every time we read some event in the book of Mark, not only are we learning who Jesus is and appreciating him more and more as our Savior, not only are we learning more and more about what it means to be invited into the kingdom of God, but we're also being challenged to determine what it looks like for us as followers of Jesus Christ to then live that out in this world. That's important for us to understand as we engage with all of the texts of the book of Mark. This week and next week, we get a whole brand new emphasis that Mark is giving for us. He's been prepping us for it. He's been prepping us for this moment, but in the next two weeks, we see Jesus take his ministry outside the context of typical Jewish society. Up until now, Jesus has all been just described as as working within the realm of the Sea of Galilee, a highly Jewish society where people have a context of knowing and understanding what God's promises are for them as a people, and they have a context of an expectation of a Savior to come. The next two weeks, today and next week, Jesus enters into an area where they don't have that context. And so they, they have... Um, They've never really been brought up with an understanding of that. Maybe some of you just a moment ago when I was going deep and wide, you're going, that's just like foreign. You're speaking French to me, right? Like I've never heard that song and these people are crazy, right? To some extent, that's what's going to happen here is Jesus is going to enter an area where they don't have all of that background information to help them understand that Jesus is who he says he is. Instead, he is going to be presenting himself to them, and they get a chance to experience that grace of God for the first time. All right, 
So in those examples, we'll see God, the gospel reaching into all parts of the world or the beginnings of that. All right, so to look with me, Mark chapter 7. We're going to start in verse 24. Just kind of scan back up, remind ourselves where we've been. Um, last week we saw Jesus engage uh, um, with his disciples, teaching and training them, and the people, the crowds, all of that stemmed from a moment when Jesus was healing lots of people, found in uh, Mark chapter 6, where he was in Gennaraset, he was healing a bunch of people, the Pharisees came, and they challenged him, and he then um, really, uh, uh, sorry, my, the word threw out my, The word has left my head. But last week, then, Jesus challenged them back in return, and he challenges the people and the disciples. All right, so when we look at this, after the end of last week, we have this picture that says, there is nothing that will defile you except for what comes out of your heart. And so as Othniel did a great job presenting that, we're left with a problem last week. We're left with a problem that our hearts are messed up, and they produce all of this list that was there, Things like evil thoughts and sexual immorality and theft and murder and adultery. And those are found in chapter 7, verses 21 and 22. Coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, evil, slander, pride, foolishness. It's like watching evening television. Um, And there's this whole list of things that are there. And we recognize that, yeah, that's produced. One of those probably identifies with things you struggle with. And that comes out of my heart. And I can't change that by stuff I do to my outside. The only thing that will change that is what gets done to my inside. And we're left with a desperate need. We're, we're left with the need of the gospel to infiltrate our souls for entry into the kingdom. We're the need of Jesus pretty badly. That lesson's pretty critical because when we go into the next section, the disciples got to know that they need to be transformed. They need to be changed in order to take the gospel into the world. They can't have prejudices. They can't have pride in their heart. They cannot have... Uh, uh, constant, consistent lifestyle of sin if they're going to take the gospel into the world. So Jesus is, again, continuing to train his disciples and helping them to know we have got to deal with these issues. And it cannot be done from these external practices. It can only be done with a heart change, a heart that has submitted itself to Jesus as Lord and Savior. All right, so he doesn't stop in the moment with that. He then begins to take them on experiences, on some situations, to train them and to teach them. It tells us this in verse 24. From there he arose, and he went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Okay, so if you're not familiar with the region, we've shown some maps before, and it's helpful for us to understand. Um, The Sea of Galilee is this big blue dot up here, if you can't quite make that all out. Capernaum is at the top of the Sea of Galilee. And really the green region that you see there is Jewish society. People who would be very familiar with Jewish practices, customs, traditions, Jewish history, and an expectation of a Savior. When you look at the orange areas, those are areas that are not going to have that as it infiltrated into their mindset. And so those are areas that are neighboring to Jewish society and places that Jesus doesn't go very often. But in this particular, in the next two weeks, we find him going. Tyre and Sidon, they're up here. They're northwest of the Sea of Galilee. They're on the sea, the Mediterranean Sea, the Great Sea. Um, and uh, they're port cities. They're places where major trade comes through. I'm just going to give you a kind of a picture of that. Now, anytime you have a major port city, it means you have lots of traffic coming in and, and leaving, coming in and leaving, coming in and leaving. They came in from the sea, they would go to the land, come out from the land, go back out to the sea, bringing goods and trafficking goods. What we know then is in those places, there is lots and lots of people flowing through there with lots and lots of variety of how they think and what their beliefs are. And so these cities are highly, um, highly diverse, if you will, highly diverse in the, in the framework of mind that they know and understand. Um, They are the, these two cities show up in the Old Testament quite often. And so when you read the Old Testament, you'd be like, oh, I've heard of Tyre and Sidon because They were the place that the big cedar logs came from 
to build the palace and to build the temple during the time of King David and King Solomon. They talk about the cedar trees in Lebanon, also known as Lebanon, this area. They talk about them being so amazing and so fit for the temple that they were used to build the temple of God. Okay, And they talked about the lush forests that were there at the time. And so these are pretty important cities in the Old Testament of a resource to help the Jews practice their worship of their God. And there was good relations at that time. Those change. Something happens here in the history of, um, of Israel. And one of those things is that Queen Jezebel comes from this area. How many people have heard of Queen Jezebel? Or heard of somebody being called a Jezebel? Okay? The reason somebody's called a Jezebel is not because we just don't like the name Jezebel, but because in biblical history, Queen Jezebel was married by King Ahab, a Israelite king or Jewish king. And so he married Queen Jezebel from this area. She was not Jewish in background. That was a bad deal for him in the first place. With her brought all of her pagan practices, all of her belief system, and she manipulated King Ahab he was, and was then transferred all of those belief systems to the people of Israel. This was not good for the people of Israel. God wants to be the one and only God, right? You, I will be the only God before you. You will have no idols before me. Those are the rules that God had placed before them. And so she brings this with them, and she was wicked. She was so wicked that anybody that rose up to stand for the God of creation, the God of Jacob, she would persecute in great ways. And one of those guys was the name Elijah. And you can read about him in the Old Testament. And so Queen Jezebel is just a really bad, really bad, wicked woman. And that's why today you would say that person's a Jezebel because they, they would be bad and wicked. Don't do that, okay? But that's the thought process behind that. All right. Um, the other thing that happens in this area is this area was condemned by God through Isaiah and Ezekiel. So you're in the Old Testament, Tyre and Sidon. There are like specific condemnations. The wrath of God will be upon you because of your wickedness, because of your pagan beliefs. Well, that's not cool, okay? As I talked about earlier, the grace of God holds back so much. To be under the wrath of God, read the book of Revelation, under the wrath of God is the outpouring of God's wrath upon all those who don't believe in Jesus Christ as your, as your Lord and Savior. And so when you read about the wrath of God, it is just an awful thing. It's something to be feared. And the, these two towns, because of their wickedness and because of um, the evil that was within them, there was condemnation that was placed upon them by God in the future. Basically, what I want you to know is that this place was highly pagan. Highly pagan, lack of belief in the God of Israel. Okay? Catch that for just a minute. It's so pagan that Jesus, when he is in a town called Bethsaida, which is right here on the top of the Sea of Galilee, he goes to this town, he does some miracles, and they reject him. So in a Jewish town where they're looking for the Savior, they reject Jesus even though they see great miracles by him. Look what Jesus says about them. Sorry, our clicker's doing some funny things. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. What he is saying to them is in even a very extremely pagan society who has no appreciation for an understanding of a Savior to come, if they saw what you have seen, they would have believed and repented. You, on the other hand, have not. And woe to you. That whole idea of woe to you is um, condemnation. That's pretty important to catch. So even in this particular moment, Jesus is showing the people of Israel how bad of a location, how wicked this area is. Okay, so now the question I think we should be begging to ask then is, why would Jesus go there, right? It'd be like, let's go to Nine Mile in Detroit, right? Or Eight Mile or whatever it is. Like, hey, well, I don't think so. Oh, hey, let's go there at midnight. No, I don't think so, right? Like, you kind of look at it and go, if this place is so bad and God has already condemned this place, why would Jesus go there? That's a, I think that's an important question. Now, the text tells us this. It says, he entered a house 
and did not want anyone to know. So Jesus, literally it tells us that Jesus went, went looking to find some space, kind of to get away, right? Those Southwest commercials, have you seen those where, you know, somebody's doing something, uh, like the, the guy that's got the password in front of the, uh, the general, he's coming in, and we need your password, and he's like, uh, you want my password? And he's like, yeah, I hate my job one, or something like that, right? And they're all like, you hate your job? That's the password that they all want to get away? You got, anybody seen these commercials? Okay, all right, Whew. So I feel like I'm up here, you know. But yeah, so like, that's kind of what it is. It's like Jesus is like, I want to get away. We want to get away. He's been, there's been often times through the book of Mark that we've seen where Jesus has wanted to teach his disciples in a remote location. Let's go to a desolate place. He goes to these areas. While he goes there, crowds follow. I think he goes, you know what? Intensity in the green area in the Jewish society is so high Maybe we could find a little space if we go to the orange area. If we go to, uh, you know, an area that doesn't, isn't looking for a savior, isn't looking for a king, isn't, they're just, they're just existing. Let's go to this spot. So Jesus calls up Airbnb, finds himself a little house out in a remote spot, right, and hangs out there. And while he's there, what happens? He gets found, right? And so in the midst of, like, looking for some space, I mean, think about the other things that are going on in the area. Um, just recently, the Pharisees, are, they're just all worked up about things that are Jesus' is teaching, right? And they're constantly fighting him and challenging him. So everywhere he goes, a group of scribes or Pharisees are like, what about this? What about this? What about this? Right? So there's like that intensity. You think about the Herodians. Herodians were loyalists to King Herod who wanted to see King Herod remain as king. And if somebody else was starting to show up that looked like they could be king, they were going to protect that. And it tells us in, in Mark chapter 3 that they joined out, uh, they joined with the Pharisees and sought to kill him. Well, that's intense, right? That's a pretty intense thing. So a couple of different reasons why that might all be happening. And then everywhere he went, what happened? Everywhere he go, great crowds would come and what did they want? They wanted him to heal people. And it was not just like one here or one there. It was great crowds, and it would be intense. So I think you look at this idea that there's just enormous intensity going on in that area. Jesus can't go to the cross yet. Based on our understanding of who Jesus is as the one and only sacrifice, he must go to the cross at the time of Passover. So he can't go now. So he's got to have a buffer time. So he takes a, a little reprieve, and let's take the disciples, and let's go someplace where not everybody knows us. Bummer, people still know me. Okay, I don't know that he's saddened by this, but it definitely is not quite as intense here. What happens? So we have a woman who finds Jesus. Oh man, this thing is like flying. All right, a woman seeks out Jesus. That's what takes place. It tells us this in verse 3. He entered a house, did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. Now that may be because in earlier chapters we learned that there were people from this area who came down out of curiosity to learn about this Jesus that is doing miracles and doing wonderful signs. And so some people from Tyre and Sidon came down there and learned about that. And when they went back, they talked about Jesus and maybe word spread. We're not sure exactly what happened. I'm sure Jesus wasn't carrying a big sign and says, Jesus is here, you know, or the doctor is in, one nickel. You know, that kind of thought process. But this idea that um, he did, somebody found out that Jesus was there. And interesting, the word, verse 25, but immediately. Now remember, in the book of Mark, this is an important phrase. It shows up several times. It shows the pace and intensity of, of this whole book. Just like reminding us that there's a lot going on. Immediately, a woman. So as soon as she found out that Jesus was there, she sought him out. She came to him. A woman, and uh, this woman came with a problem, right? What was her problem? Her problem was that her daughter had an unclean spirit. And that basically means she's demon-possessed. Now, it doesn't tell us what the ailment is. It just tells us that she was demon-possessed, right? And so what we do know is that whatever it was that this demon was doing to this little daughter, it, it made this, this woman come to Jesus and seek him out. She was in such a place of need that she was willing to come to Jesus. Now, 
what do we know about demon possession from the um, New Testament? Anytime it's talked about, it usually has destructive things going on with it. Makes sense, right? The thief comes to kill and destroy, or Jesus comes to bring life. And so demon possession in the New Testament, as we read about it, is usually destroying the person. All right, one. One time it's talked about where the evil spirit is throwing a young boy into the fire on a regular basis. So the boy is possessed by a demon, and it goes near a fire, and it throws his body into the fire, and that parent is seeking relief. Right? Another time it talks about seizures, where I, um, I, it's convulsing the person regularly. Another time it talks about the man. We just read about him in Mark here this year, where it talks about the man who was demon-possessed, and he became so wild and insane that nothing could hold him, and, and he just was excommunicated from his community and running around naked and hollering all over the place, totally out of his mind. Those are examples of demon possession. So although the, the Scripture doesn't tell us ex exactly what kind of ailment this demon was doing to this little girl, it was evident enough that this woman wanted her daughter to be set free from this desperately, desperately seeking out Jesus. I also understand that this woman is not Jewish, right? It tells us this in the text. It says she came, she was a Gentile, or she was a Greek, depending on which translation you're reading. And she's a Syrophoenician by birth. That means that her whole background is based in Syrian blood, Syrian background, and the region of Tyre and Sidon. She's from this area. Her whole belief system has been structured around pagan worship. And uh, you can go and read about the different types of idols that they worshipped. Oftentimes, the idols they worshipped in this area encouraged children child sacrifice. Okay, so that one might have been one of her options. If you want to relieve your child from this, then take her and sacrifice her to the gods. So something happens in this woman, though, where she gets an idea that everything I've learned about the pagan worship of these idols and these gods is not going to help me. I need to go to this Jewish prophet rabbi. He has something that can help me. So she's willing to go. She has no background. She's not looking for a Messiah like, it, like the people of Israel. But yet she chooses to go to Jesus. And what does she do? She falls at Jesus' feet. Tells us that she came and fell at his feet. She bowed down. She desperately is seeking help. She falls at Jesus' feet. And this just kind of reveals to us this idea of who she understands him to be. You fall at somebody's feet when you really, truly believe that they have some authority and something that they can bring you that you can't do on your own. And so there's this reverence that she brings herself before him. And then what she do? She begs him. You only beg when you're desperate. Like, I don't, I don't know that I even really know what that means to beg. Maybe when Teresa broke up with me in college for a week. <laughs> did I understand what that meant, right? But for the most part, I don't really understand what it means to be so desperate. That's not true. I think between that moment and when I was in a canoe in the midst of a great storm, did I understand what it meant to desperately want relief from something. That's what this word begged means here. This word begged means that I'm continually seeking, repeatedly seeking for help, continually asking. If you go to the, if you go to the Gospel of Mark, or Matthew, excuse me, and you read of this account, it tells us that she was, she was repeatedly, continually asking, and the disciples were like, Jesus, Send her away. She keeps asking for this. Kind of like that kid that, you know, kind of comes up and he's like, can I have, can I have, can I have, can I have, can I have? Can I have? No! Stop asking me! It's kind of what happens with the disciples. 
His disciples, she's like, I need to see Jesus. I need help from Jesus. Can somebody help? Can I, can I see Jesus? Can I see Jesus? No, he's trying to get away. Can, can I see Jesus? Can I see? No, he's trying to get away, right? And finally, they like turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, this woman keeps harassing us about getting to see you. Can you just send her away? Jesus then, somehow or another, she gets through the defenses. Between the two stories, we understand that she, she, she manages to get through this, uh, this moment, and she gets to Jesus, right? And she begs him, seeking help. The other thing that happens here is that Jesus leverages the situation to teach his disciples. And this is interesting because there's this pause. This lady is desperately looking for help, and Jesus then teaches in the midst of it. Other times, Jesus just reaches out and touches, just reaches out and heals. In fact, that should be a clue to us that something different is happening here. It, when we look at what Jesus is doing in the book of Mark, anytime somebody comes to him, he basically gives without, without hesitation. His mercy, his power, all of those things are extended to people as they come to him. And he, and he does it graciously. In fact, he does it for people who don't, they don't even necessarily believe in him as the Messiah. Think about the 5,000. When he fed the 5,000, odds are not all 5,000 believed in him as the Messiah. Yet all of them ate. Right? And Jesus doesn't require faith in order to to relieve physical tensions. He's just gracious. He just gives it. So if in a moment when Jesus typically would just heal flat out, I'm just going to heal you, if in a moment he actually steps back for a second and gives a little pause and then says something, it should make us go, hmm, something's going on here. Because Jesus is pretty gracious, and he's never withheld any of his gracious power, and merciful power, then something must be going on here. And we need to be paying attention because Jesus is doing something. And what he's doing is he's leveraging this situation to help teach his disciples. <coughs> Let's see how he does it, okay? He says this to her. This is how he leverages it. He says, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. So the woman's begging with him. Catch that situation. She's begging for help because she's so desperate to see her daughter set free from demon possession. And Jesus says, let the children be fed first, for it's not right to throw the children's bread to the dogs. That seems a little, that should cause tension for us. Doesn't it cause a little tension for you? Like it, it should leave you with a little tension like, What? Did he just call her a dog? Isn't that what it kind of reads? Like, I'm feeding the children here, and I'll, I'll take care of you in a minute. Take care of the dogs later. That causes, caused me tension as I was sitting here wrestling through this text because I'm like, that seems a little harsh, Jesus. That's just not like you. This isn't normal. This isn't what I've seen so far in the book of Mark. Again, then that should bring me a clue that Jesus is doing something here to make sure that he can teach his disciples. A couple things we need to know as we consider this. One, that as we look at this text, there are Greek words in here that we don't always understand. One is dog. Jesus does use the word dog here, and it does point towards this lady. And so sort of, he calls her a dog. But it's important for us to catch the context. Even in our society today, there's a couple of different types of dogs, isn't there? There would be dogs that I would not go anywhere near. And then there are dogs that I still wouldn't go anywhere near. <laughs> but my wife would. And for those of you that you don't know, I am not a pet person whatsoever. 
have no desire. But there are people who are. How many of you are dog people? And love your dog so much, and the dog just sits on your lap or whatever. Anyways, good for you. Um, it's interesting. There are parts of the world, I've been to parts of the world now, a couple different places, and both places I've been to, there are dogs that just wander the streets. You don't actually see that here. You just don't see dogs wandering the streets. We have animal control. We try to protect. And maybe there's other places in the, in the United States that there is like that, but you don't see it here. So, like, one of the things that stood out to me when I went to Greece and when I went to Ecuador is both places, there are just dogs everywhere. And they're mangy. They're, like, nasty. In fact, the group from the, from the school here went to Ecuador here not two, or two years ago, was it? Two years ago that they went? Yeah, it was two years ago. And the, all the students got down there, and we, we got report back that they were struggling with fleas. The people were. Like, How'd you get fleas? Well, they've been petting the dogs. And I, I now have been there, and I'm like, what? These dogs wander around. They eat the trash. They clean up after all the street vendors. They're mangy. They're nasty. And I just, like, I could just see, like, oh, it's such a cute dog. And I'm like, oh, don't touch. I just don't like dogs. I was chased by a dog as a kid. Ugh, it's bad news. Anyways, so... Interestingly enough, we have two different frameworks by which we identify dogs. Agreed? We have dogs that are in our homes and dogs that are not in our homes. Okay? And it is true, catch this, it's really true, that the Jewish priests, the Jewish Pharisees, the religious elite, they referred to the Gentiles as dogs. You do not engage with those Gentile dogs. But when they referred to them as dogs, they referred to them as those mangy, flea-bitten, flea-ridden mutts. That's not what Jesus is doing here. How do I know that? One, there are two different Greek words that point to us in that. Now, if you don't know Greek, you can actually still do this. You can look at this particular text and know that Jesus is not referring to the, the mangy mutts that wander the streets and you don't want anything to do with. Instead, he's referring to the type of dog that would be in your home, a puppy, a house dog, a house pet. How do I know that? Because what does the text say? Where is the dog? Where's the dog? It's a table. It's, it's near the table in the home. And so that's the contextual clue that tells us that Jesus is not referring to her as the dog that has, is unfit to be anywhere near but instead a dog that is a part of the home. And from what I understand of you dog lovers, that's how you feel, is that your dog is a part of the family, right? And that's really cool. That's kind of what Jesus is communicating here. Now, still makes us feel a lot uncomfortable why Jesus would say, I'm going to feed the children first, and then I'll take care of you second, right? Does he mean that the Gentiles don't deserve the gospel first? Does it mean that Jesus is like holding back? Not at all. But we do have to understand God's plan of the gospel. Jesus, got, Jesus is fulfilling God's plan for the gospel, and the gospel was meant to come to the Jews first. In fact, the Jews were meant to have received the gospel mentality long ago when God chose them out of all the nations of the world. God chose Abraham out of all the nations of the world and said, you will be my people. You will be the father of many nations. I will give you this land. And all the nations of the world will be blessed by you, through you. So the entire thought process is that the nation of Israel were meant to receive the blessing of God, reveal that blessing to the world, and invite others to come and join in on the fun. The problem is Israel went, ooh, we like these blessings. We'll keep them to ourselves and the rest of you. We don't want you to do anything to do with you. And then they, kept, they began to just trickle off and, and seek those blessings from other forms of worship. So then God punishes them and then brings them back. And in this moment, he does the most gracious thing to the people of Israel that you could ever imagine. He sends his Messiah into their midst so that they could recognize him. Hey, bye. Hey, everybody. This is what you've been long awaiting for. Here's your Messiah. And the Jews are supposed to go, oh, he 
He's here. But they don't. In fact, we know that they reject him so much that they nail him to a cross and reject him continually. So Paul says it this way. Paul helps us understand this. First he says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Oh, come on. There it is. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first for the Jew and also for the Gentiles. And then he says, I am a messenger to the Gentiles. Later in the book of Romans. So he's unveiling this idea and understanding that the gospel is meant to go beyond the borders of, of um, the Jewish society, but it was supposed to go to them first. Then they reject Jesus, and so they have this experience going on. He says this, Paul also says this, rather, through their trespass, so what's their trespass? The rejection of the Messiah. Their, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Praise the Lord. Because all of us predominantly in this room would not know the, the message of the gospel unless the message of the gospel had gone to the Gentiles. So my history is not Jewish. Right? So praise the Lord for that. Okay. But the disciples are still coming from a background that had been trained and taught that the gospel message was for Jews. And they needed to be reminded that that extends well beyond the borders of Israel. And they engage in this scenario with this lady. So they're standing there, and you can imagine it, right? They're standing there um, thinking about this whole situation. And... Put yourself in the room. Disciples come in the room, or they're in the room, or whatever, and the lady comes in, she begs, and then Jesus says, you know, it's for the children first and not for the dogs. We know what happens. We've read the text. But imagine for that one moment in time what might cross your mind. You might be like, this is awkward, right? Or you might be like, yeah, Jesus, get her. She doesn't deserve this. Right? That's kind of actually the feel from Matthew that we get is the disciples are like struggling and going, she's bothering us. Send her away. She doesn't deserve that. Or they might have been going, hell has no fury like a woman scorned. Run. Right? There might be any kinds of thought processes that kick through here that go through that. And so Jesus actually surprises them. And then they get even shocked all the more because the woman responds. Look what the woman says. The woman says this. She answers him, yes, Lord. I agree with you, Lord. I submit to what you're saying, Lord. It's basically what she's saying here. Lord. Catch that. It's a term, not used often, but a term that, that signifies your understanding of submission to one who is, who is in authority. It tells us in the book of Romans, right? Anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It also tells us that in your heart that Jesus is Lord, right? You'll be saved. So there's this interesting little throw in right here by Mark to say she gets it and she's not arguing with him. Yes, Lord, I agree with you. And then after submitting to that, showing some, she shows some humility in it. She says, even the dogs under the table. What is she identifying with? She's, she's identifying with the fact that, yes, I know I am not part of your group. I know I'm not part of the Jewish society. I know that I'm not we're at the same level as everybody else here. I'm a dog. I'm a puppy in your home. I get that. And then what does she say? She appeals. This little appeal that says this, even the children, or even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. What is she asking for? take just a scrap. I'm so desperate for help. I believe that just a scrap off your table is enough to help me. 
See, that was the problem with the Jews. And I think sometimes it's a problem with me. I forget how much grace I've received. And that just a little bit of grace is more than enough. More than enough. So, in the midst of Jesus leveraging this situation, he teaches the disciples that God's grace can extend and is meant to extend beyond the borders of Jewish society. Yes, it's meant to go to the Jews first, but it's meant to go beyond. And then he also then puts this woman's faith on display. And just think about that from the disciples' standpoint. Their minds just probably just went, what just happened here? We were expecting her to blow up and run away. Oh, that's not what happened. She just, she just put us to shame in our understanding of who Jesus is. And then Jesus says, for this statement, for what you have said and how you have said it, it reveals your faith. And then it goes on and says, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And imagine how stabilizing to her faith or how firming to her faith it would have been when she walked home and walked in the door and she found her daughter free from the demon possessed. Now, we, under, we have to understand some message has come back to these guys because it's now been given to us an account. Does that make sense? Like this situation is going on, the lady leaves. She goes home, she finds the daughter well. Really, the disciples didn't go with her. So somehow or another, the message came back. And at that moment, I think the disciples probably were really like, wow, God's grace just flows deep and wide. Deep. Like powerful and fulfilling and satisfying and wide, extending to the plains beyond the, beyond the culture of Jewish society, but into the rest of the world. And disciples, you need to know that. Because you're going to go into spaces in the next year that where you are going to have to take the grace of God into places you're going to be very uncomfortable with. Read the book of Acts. And actually, the church is going to fight about this stuff. So you read a book of Acts and you find out that the church is fighting about Gentile behavior versus Jewish background and these people should be circumcised and these people should eat this kind of stuff and there's this tension that happens in the church and they've all forgotten that Jesus illustrated to them that his grace goes beyond the Jewish borders and it's not about what you do on the outside but what happens inside your heart as you take Jesus to be your Lord and Savior and you trust him for his provision. That is the gospel that they had to be ready to go take and go do. So what do we learn? Let me just wrap this up for us this morning. A couple, thing, a couple different things. One is this, that the grace of God is available to people from everywhere. That's important, one, to us, and it's evident in us today. So we can see this. This is an acknowledgement, but I think it's also a challenge as we go into this world, because I think it's easy sometimes to be comfortable with where we're at or the people we like and take the gospel to those particular areas, but we're not always so good about taking the gospel into areas that we're uncomfortable with, with people we're uncomfortable with. And this message tells us that the grace of God is available to all people from everywhere, right? It also tells us that, that even a crumb of grace is enough to satisfy. I think this has been the most challenging one for me this week as I've considered thinking about this lady's response, that I'd take just a crumb. I'd take just a crumb off your table because I believe that a crumb off of your table is enough to satisfy what I need. Because the plenty on the table is so vast, so deep, and so wide that it's, that the power of your grace will satisfy me. I can get pretty discontent in this world, thinking that there are other things I need or that God is holding back from me. But the reality is, is God has given me way more than a crumb. God has given us his son, Jesus Christ. 
and he sacrificed him on the cross on our behalf and exchanged his life for ours. That is way more than a crumb. And so let's be satisfied, right, in the grace of God. And I think the last thing that I, I, I look at here is that Jesus is the source of God's grace. And I, I am reminded of this as I think about it. Jesus could have just stayed around the Sea of Galilee. Here's a bunch of people with cultural context and uh, easy to communicate with. He could talk about God and they'll know who he is, all that kind of stuff. But he intentionally leaves the region and goes to an area where people aren't exposed to him. And he he welcomes an opportunity to be exposed to him, and he then gives grace. Without Jesus in that area and in that moment, this lady's daughter would still have been suffering from the demon possessed, or from demon possession. But Jesus was the source of God's grace that she needed. And the same thing's true for us today. We need Jesus in our lives. We need a constant reminder of that sacrifice to keep, continue to fuel us as we live. So a couple of questions as we ent- enter into the week. How do we view grace? Do we view it as available to all or only those we think deserve it? Is that a heart attitude that's going on inside of us that we're, uh, we need to have changed? I got to tell you, I'm preparing for this while I'm working with a bunch of band students throughout this week from the high school. And not every one of those band students do I always agree with their lifestyle choices, where they're living, or how they're, how they're behaving, all of those types of things. And I can just get infuriated with them and be upset, but this thing just kept rolling through my head throughout the week. Is God's grace available to them? And, and what role do I play in helping to reveal that grace to the people that I come in contact with? Or do I take an attitude that says, they don't deserve it, and they don't even deserve my time and energy to share it with them? Shame on me. Is it never enough? Is God's grace never enough? Are you always seeking something more? Do you believe that God's holding back from you? Do I believe that? Do we believe that? Or do we always need more? And are we really turning to Jesus? Are we relying on Christ? I would hope that this week, as you engage in the world as disciples of Jesus Christ, that one, you would recognize the awesomeness of God's grace that is so deep, so wide, and so far-reaching that it penetrates all corners of the globe or wants to and longs to, and it, and it wants to do that through the church. It wants to do that through people who have met and understand, understood the grace of God and that you know the grace of God so well that you can't help but testify to the greatness of it in all realms that you go to. Allow God's grace to impact you this week and allow it to be the heart song of your life. Father God, thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the the illustration today that was given to us, your example of giving grace and teaching us through that, helping us to recognize who you are and our desire and need to share the grace with the whole world. Lord, I'm thankful for the transforming power that you have to change us and to help us to be satisfied in your grace and to to put off the desires of the flesh, and, and just to be totally satisfied in you. And I pray that this week, I've longed for this in my own life, to be totally satisfied in what you have provided every single day for the glory of your name. And Lord, I pray that, um, that this church would be a mighty beacon of the gospel of grace to everyone we come in contact with. And that people would submit to you as Lord and Savior because of the gracious example in which we live as recipients of that. Even today, Lord, in some relationship or in some place that we go, may you use us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, There are no activities tonight. I have another thank you card. (laughs) 
And the winner is, oh no, sorry. <clears throat> First Baptist Church, thank you for the love offering. It will definitely go to help with hotel bills, hospital, food bills, eating out, gas money, medical bills. We truly appreciate your thoughtfulness. This road is long and hard, and we appreciate your support. Love Tom and Mariah, Jace, Marley, and Ireland Ward. So you guys are here today, and we're here. So grateful for that. How's Marley doing? Yeah. Recovering okay from the surgeries? Okay. Okay. What's the next step, Tom? Okay, so you're just waiting. Yeah. Okay, no, waiting can be hard. So continue to keep the words in your prayers, and uh, you know, feel free to to reach out to them and care for them through cards and and even just phone calls and those types of things. I know they appreciate that greatly. Okay, we do have a men's group that will meet here on Sunday or Tuesday morning, six thirty. There is the fish group that is meeting today after the morning service. Um, and so if you're interested in learning more about what it means to follow Christ uh, together in community, that's an opportunity for you to do that. Uh, prayer meeting on Thursday night. And uh, again, uh, I will be up at the camp. I'm not too far out of reach. Um, so contact one of the deacons. You can contact me as well. I, have, I will have phone service. And uh, we will take care, we'll try to take care of you the best that we can. Uh, my grandpa is still in, the, in hospice care. And every, I just keep waiting I think the next, when my dad texts me once in a while, and when he texts me, I think that's the moment, but it's not. And so we just kind of, that's just where we're sitting, waiting. So it could happen at any point. I could actually be called from camp this week and need to go for a funeral. So we're just, we're just waiting. So continue to keep us in your prayers as well. Okay? Have a great day, guys. Thanks. attempt to look at a new song.